right. Um, well, let's get it started. I guess this is probably the quorum for the, this week. Uh, the double time zone shift. Uh, I think blew everybody out of the water on this. But uh, um, okay, some quick announcements, and I'll turn it over to Paul. Um, but uh, we got the Sarah Eastern Conference uh, in Green Bank, uh, 20 to 22 August. Um, go ahead and uh, go to our website to see the details. Um, you can sign up for uh, online uh, at the uh, Sarah store. Um, if you're a member of Sarah, you've got this uh, March, April Sarah journal that's out. And uh, I have to apologize to your fellow Australian, uh, Steve Olney. I had his article in there, but I forgot to actually put it in the journal. So I, I'm going to put it in the next one. Um, we also uh, updated the index of all the journal articles uh, for the last 40 years, and the uh, uh, plus the uh, all the videos, and those are in the. Uh, uh, that's also on the website. You can download that and uh, do research. Uh, okay. Um, We've also put uh, a new uh, series out uh, called uh, Radio Astronomy, uh, Constant Variables and Formulas, uh, where I'm trying to get uh, the very simple, basic uh, equations, how they're developed. And uh, so uh, when we start talking about uh, uh, focal length and uh, things like that, that people can understand how to do it. So uh, I've got eight of them up so far. I'm looking for uh, if anybody has any ideas of what they would like to see a quick video on these are all pretty much less than five minutes a piece which is one of my criteria um so you can learn quickly a, a quick concept and then not have to spend hours trying to sift through a big big video to find it uh uh one of the uh ones i'm going to show uh today if uh we got time which we probably will is the uh how to uh measure your your uh, therm uh, system noise temperature, so TSIS, and uh, part of that, uh, I want to see if people can uh, try to measure TSIS on their home radio telescopes, and then um, and then send in uh, a quick one-page summary so I can put all that in the journal, and we'll compare everybody's home telescopes uh, T system, uh, uh, and that'll, uh, then we can start improving all of those, trying to, you know, upgrade everybody's system to get their t-sys uh, down to a lower value uh okay um paul we got it's all yours okay thanks rich um i'm just looking at on this i thing about the eastern conference <clears throat> and matching it up here so uh 20 sunday the 20th do you have do you have a any times available um well, it's normally uh, normally from the morning to the evening on uh, uh, it would be Eastern time, so a yep. two hour uh, there. Uh, well, we'll see. They're ten hour. I'm not sure what they are. Ten hours from you guys. Well, if you look on New York time, uh, on the clocks and stuff, that's the Eastern time, uh, and. Uh, it's normally in the morning to about five in the afternoon is the general stuff. Uh, we don't have a detailed schedule yet. Um, so this is probably really the 21st, uh, 21st to 23rd year time zone. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's probably all the wrong time, but uh, as we're saying, if you do it online and we will record it and uh, we'll be able to put it, uh, put it up on the YouTube channel. So, uh, I certainly came along. Yeah, I came along last year, so there must be some overlap. I'm just trying to work out. So it's 7 yeah. p.m. for you at the moment, is it? It's uh, yeah, 7, 7 p.m. Eastern time right now. Yeah, and we're nine, so that's five nine's fourteen. We're fourteen hours ahead. So if you're starting at nine o'clock in the morning, that's. 9 p.m. It's about 11 p.m. Yeah, that's um, not too bad. Yeah, might might scrape right at the beginning. I, I think the ones in the middle might be a bit tricky when it's three o'clock in the morning here. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'll have a look at that and um, possibly even do a a contribution 
from this end. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. Maybe you want to do a, a quick announcement set um, without a formal presentation. That's be fine too. Yeah. And uh, um, now we would, I'm sorry, I've got so many screens here. I'm getting confused. So, so I've got a, I've got a screen up there, and I've got a screen down here, and I've got a screen over here. Uh, I'm going to share. So, um, from from me personally, um, been more optical astronomy, interestingly. But um, I have been uh, following a course um, with someone in Nova Scotia uh, doing Milky Way photography. And I was struck by the overlap between what we do uh, looking at the uh, Milky Way in the radio spectrum compared with what they're doing or what I'm, I'm doing in optical, because it's the same, it's the same game, really. Um, there are apps around like photo pills uh, and Stellarium and so on where you can look ahead where is the Milky Way, in particular where is the core of the Milky Way, um, and you can get your azimuth and elevation and you can plan ahead. They, they plan very carefully, so there might be a lighthouse or a rocky formation in the foreground, and they plan where, exactly where to put the camera so they get the Milky Way coming uh, associated with uh, stuff on the ground but it's 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 almost exactly the same game that we're playing in in chasing things in the sky uh, so um i'm gonna try and share a screen from the ipad see whether it'll work no it's not doing it share a screen ipad it looks like it's trying to do it uh yeah i'm just samsung zoom there we are yeah i don't sometimes, see it yeah yeah sometimes this works there we go yep that works yep all right so uh first the uh eclipse viewing that we were just talking about uh this is at school, and that's the the solar filter. Um, and uh, there, were, there was a group of us there um, having a look at the the sky. And then this is one of my from my student in the U3A course. We do backyard astronomy, so he had the um, binoculars on a tripod, and then onto card and that's a pretty good representation of what uh, what we got it was about 20 percent um so that was that was pretty good so the the live viewing we we got a really good view through the uh, solar filter and then also the pinhole projection but the astronomy stuff what's interesting is that uh, my own camera which is a Canon G1X, has a star setting. And this is just in my, in my garden uh, where you can see the brightest stars, but when you put it on the setting, it extends the time. So again, the overlap with what we're doing in the radio frequencies is really clear. Um, it, this is not yet stacking, but this is a longer exposure. It's so like we might do a, you know, uh, uh, Five minute collection of data on the on the dish. Uh, this is the same idea. So I was amazed how much I can see. And uh, Northern Hemisphere people, can you spot the Southern Cross? Andrew, I'm sure Andrew can. It's it's interesting, isn't it? We, we're just so used to it, even though, although in my um, U3A group, I've gone outside with them at the end of a session and said, uh, there's the Southern Cross. And there's, some of them say, you know, these are sort of uh, you know, aging people, senior people, never looked at it. Oh, that's the Southern Cross, which is absolutely amazing. Um, can you see my, my cursor? Yes. Yep. So here are the pointers right down just above the bushes here. That's the clue. Once you find the pointers, follow the pointers, 
and here's the cross. So it's on its it's on its side. It's pointing the the, the, the vertical axis is pointing down to about eight o'clock. And I think if I do that, you can see so alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, the little one there. So on our flag, there are the five stars of the Southern Cross. So that was the first uh, foray into uh, pointing the camera at the sky. Now, can you spot that one? I realize I'm talking to um, radio astronomers, not optical astronomers. Yeah, we can't even figure out time zone, Paul. So uh, you got to. It's upside it. down. It's upside down. Yeah, that's right. What are we it looking is. at? <laughs> oh, now I figure. What What yeah. are we looking at? M forty two and friends. Yeah, yeah, correct. So Orion. Um, yeah. So here's the Orion Nebula, and as you say, for you it's upside down, um, because the constellations were defined by Northern Hemisphere people. So you see the belt, yep. and uh, Hunter, so Hunter standing see, on his head. Yeah, you can just see Sirius up in the top. I don't know whether you can see it. My, I've got stuff in the way here. Yeah, just right up the top. So I follow the three, and there's Sirius right up the top, the brightest star in the sky. And I think Northern Hemisphere. Do you get Sirius? Some part of the year. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. funny. That's funny. I always knew it would be different, but I've never seen I've never seen a photo from from the southern hemisphere with a uh, a, a ground reference. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I thought that's thought that's why it might be interesting for you to see these because um as I say Andrew and I are used to this. Uh but um yeah, there's there's Orion um and uh, as I say, this is just the star setting on a, a Canon G1X. There's no, there's no magic, um, you know, maths or anything going on here. Is that the LMC? Is uh, you? No. You, yeah, you <laughs> won't a, get that. It's a, no. it's a smudge on my, on my, on no. my viewer. Well, I was about to ask if that was a possum across the wire. Is it the uh, uh, next one over that one? That there, yes. That's my um. That's my uh forty meter dipole. Okay. Yeah. That's, the, that's the that's the insulator. Thought you maybe can see, you can see down the bottom there. You can see um also that one. That's the six meter uh, antenna I use for uh meteor scatter. So that's pointing down to Andrew's neck of the woods. It's pointing down to northern Tasmania. Uh, and I think you use the same transmitter, don't you, Andrew? You use um, RAE? Yeah. Yeah. So that's on 50 megs, 50.057. Um, so then variations on a theme. That one's got a, interestingly, it's got a two streaks and i think they might be um satellites i think they have to be satellites those two um so that shows the southern cross a bit more clearly uh that's got an airplane in it it's quite good fun uh so this was just playing around some more but then i went away uh, to New South Wales and uh, this is now a dark sky site so Bortle 2 I think it is uh, in terms of optical and this is as the sun's going down so again spot the southern cross the pointers are here and the cross is up here and then as the evening goes on, we ended up, I don't know how clearly you can see that, it's quite dark, but we're starting to get lots and lots of uh, stars, but then of course the clouds came in, 
as they always do. Radio astronomers don't care about that. Um, so playing around with different shots. Um, you're starting to get some nebulosity, but again, the parallel with the radio astronomy stuff is if you take uh, five shots or ten shots and stack them in software, it starts to bring out the color and the nebulosity. So it's, a, it's the exact same process. It's just different frequency when you think about it. Uh, now, in some of these, you start to see, uh, depending on which way you're looking, you start to see Scorpius. Uh, and that's pretty good. So this is later in the evening. Now the pointers are here and the Southern Cross is now vertical. So it's, done, it's doing its circumpolar bit. And so radio astronomers might recognize some of this stuff. This is Carina. And the Korean yeah, Nebula. My old hunting ground in there. Old Beale yeah. supernova remnants in there somewhere. <laughs> what What's really interesting? It's starting to get some colour now. And um, what's really interesting is then to match it up with a with Stellarium or a, a Sky Atlas and actually identify some of these things. So this is still the star setting on the G1X. It's not even without any stacking yet. Um, but then we eventually get to something like this, which is really where I'm trying to get to with this little presentation. Um, so this is now stacking. So I took five shots as quickly as possible so we don't get sky movement. And then they go into a program called Sequator. And Sequator just sits the images on top of one another. So the signal goes up, noise tends to go down because of cancellation. So this is just like what we're doing in radio astronomy. And you now see very clearly the color. This is the core right down the bottom coming up over the horizon. And this stretch here is the, the indigenous structure of the dark emu. So uh, that's very important in the Aboriginal culture, the indigenous culture, because they use the dark emu as an indicator of what time of year it is, when to go and get the e, the eggs and all, all those sorts of things. And what you can also see here, some of these, if I get the right one, uh, can't see it in that one. Yes, here's the head of the Scorpius, and then there's Antares, which is a good uh, find a point of reference, and then the Scorpius Scorpion comes around, and there's the tail, the cat's eyes, uh, down the bottom. Um, so, in terms of the optical people finding the Milky Way, Antares is a good starting point because it sits so close to the core of the Milky Way. Um, I'm just trying to find the one that has the coal sack, which I've lost for, uh, for the moment. Oh, yeah, you can see it here. Here are the pointers. And then up here, this is the Southern Cross, and this is the coal sack which is just a region where there are very, very few stars and it stands out really, really clearly. Um, I'll just stop that share. So th that's what's kept me occupied for a little while, but I just thought I'd share it here because, because of the parallels with what we're doing. Really, is radio astronomy is the same as optical. We're trying to get as big a signal as possible. We're trying to reduce the noise 
we're using long exposures, um, sensitive sensors. Um, we've got the we can use amplifiers in RF. We can't use amplifiers in in um, optical. Uh, long exposures and stacking, essentially, uh, similarities. Very a lot of similarities. And uh, through the Astronomical Society, we're just trying to develop some banners or posters or whatever for when members of the public come and look at our radio astronomy installation at Heathcote. Try and explain well what 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 is radio astronomy? Radio astronomy is essentially the same as optical astronomy. We're just using a different frequency, different wavelength. Um, and we have the advantage then that we can see through clouds. Um, so uh, that's my little bit, Rich. Um, that was a real fun tour. Thank you for that. And the Southern Cross. Um, do you, uh, we see the scorpion uh, during the summertime. Do you lose it then, I assume? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a winter. For us, it's a winter thing. So when, when I do my U3A class, that starts in at the beginning of the calendar year. So the first one is February. So we've got a summer sky. And I, I do signpost stars. Well, you know, looking at for well, the, the brightest stars that you can see from your garden, from the city. So you get used to what is where. And then when you go out to a dark sky site, like those photographs we were just looking at, um, then you can find the pointers. You find the Southern Cross uh, when you're looking south, and from that you can work out the circumpolar stuff. Um, but then when you're looking north, it depends on time of year. So starting in February, Orion is the main set of pointers. That's your starting point, and then up to Sirius and so on. Uh, we've just gone going through autumn. Uh, Leo, the lion, has been um, quite dominant in the north. And that's quite a good one, even though um, you would say it's upside down. Yes, it is upside down. The, the head is down the bottom, uh, Regulus and Denebola and so on. And then as we go into winter, and it's just starting to happen now, uh, Scorpius is starting to appear. And certainly in Melbourne, it's just about overhead in winter. It's, it's, it's a, you can just see the whole thing straight over you. Um, and of course, if that's where the Milky Way is, then that's where you need to point your antenna. If you're doing a, a Milky Way, um, you know, Meridian Passage or something like that. Um, and it's interesting comparing the optical astronomers and they're searching for the for the Milky Way in the northern hemisphere. So the person running the course, she's in um, Nova Scotia, and the, the Milky Way is really low; it never gets high. And so they can do the complete arc. They can do in with one shot, they can get the arc horizon to horizon. Um, last week when I was in New South Wales, the, it wasn't overhead, but it was pretty close. The, it was coming up in uh, in the um, east, I thought in the, where was the core, sorry, in the west where the core, no, east where the core was, and then really, really high, and then over to the west, there was no way that you could get that arc in in one shot. So you have to stitch or something like that. So the, the difference was really quite marked. Um, for you, Andrew, it would be probably lower. Is that right? We, we, you know, because you're further south? Yes, that's right. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Scorpius is, a, is, a, is the main feature in winter uh, for us. And a really good reference point because Antares stands out well, because it's overhead. It's really clear. You're away from all the atmospheric crap low down. And you're getting a really, really good view of Antares and you can follow the whole thing. There's a cat. Um, and uh, therefore, in terms of where to point your, your antenna, then you, there you've got some reference points at night at least. Um, any other Comments. I'll, I'll while Andrew is talking, I'll try and dig out the one that has um, large Magellanic cloud in it as well. Because that was certainly very visible. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, great stuff. That's um, I, I've done a bit of that myself. Um, stacking is just the way to go these days. Um, I use, um, well, there's a number of different bits of software out there, of course, for seeing where the Milky Way is for radio astronomy use too. I, I use um, Jim radio Sky's, some, yeah, some of Jim Sky's stuff um, for that. And I've been um, looking at the Milky Way and the radio of late. So, mm, no, good stuff. Um, so I might hand to Andrew for a quick update on what you've been doing. And I think you've got some Eclipse related stuff there as well. Thanks uh, very much. Just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen here. So a quick update for me. So this is a, a recent view of my backyard down here in Tasmania. And um, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm interested mainly in low frequency radio astronomy but um you guys are getting me excited about going to higher frequencies <laughs> so i've dug my dish out uh and yeah i'm keen to get into uh measuring my t-sys um i've been doing or well, heading towards that for some of my other measurements so i'll come to that in a bit. um but just a quick uh run around so i'm just out of the city and um this is my shed uh, and my house is up behind the trees up there, we're on a, um, a, a few hectares of land and uh, we've had a bit of rain, so it's greened up a bit, but uh, we're on tank water, so um, collecting all the water we can. Um, has been dry at, at times here. Um, but um, so I've got a variety of antennas, so just a quick run around. I've got um, some experimental things at um, HF. So this is a, uh, a loop antenna, uh, which is covering Pretty much baseband zero megahertz to about 50 or 60 and I, I use that for a variety of things sun jupiter um meteors even uh and currently that's kind of looking north south um and this uh i use um active antenna amplifier you look those up on the internet really versatile um I've got this in a number of different configurations, and I've also got a dipole attached to it. And uh, uh, so, um, yeah, encourage anybody to have a look at that. In fact, um, I'll, I'll say something a little bit later, but I'm hoping to use um, some of the hardware here with um, a bow tie antenna that I'm looking to build, uh, very much like the folks in uh, the Astronomical Society of South Australia have put together for their e Callisto work. Um, yeah, they've done a great job there. Um, so I've got a, here is a, um, uh, a two meter antenna. That's a Yagi that's looking north at the moment. I have been doing some Milky Way measurements with that of late, but previous to that, um, I'm working with um, some radio amateurs to look at um, a roll scatter and we've had some more detections of digital modes coming um, back off the aurora, had a few auroras of late, so that's progressing. Um, you can, if anybody's a radio amateur, they can look up the Debus, D-E-B-U-S magazine, which I think is a, a British magazine, and there's a couple of reports in there from, from our OBS. Um, this is the, this is my um, uh, six meter, system here and that's meteor so that's looking at that transmitter that Paul's looking at um yes. picks up solar flares too and <laughs> a lot of interference around the place so there's a bit of work happening locally and I'm, I am getting a bit hassled by some interference but we've just got to put up with that um I have been wandering the neighborhood with my radio looking a bit strange I suppose I take the dog for a walk there's our dog the scale um and take the AM radio out and try and find interference sources so <laughs> Uh, yeah, people probably uh, wondering what I'm doing anyway. Um, XL TV satellite uh, dish. So um, I have looked at um, beacons from geosynchronous satellites with that, looking at um, rain attenuation. But um, uh, well, it's got you know it's a 10 gig feed. Uh, have seen the sun with it. Um, like to get that down to the hydrogen line and have a bit of a play if I can. Uh, have enough. Other bits of hardware to, to do that and make a, a rudimentary feed for that. So you guys have uh, inspired me to get into a bit of that. 
uh, blitz or tongue lightning detection system here I run. Uh, and then there's another loop system down here. And I've been experimenting uh, using this little amplifier up here with an earth probe antenna. So you're basically just putting a couple of um, uh, electrodes in the ground and using the earth as a receiver for HF. Um, I've been doing that at VLF and um, I've seen some solar flares with this system. I'll, I'll kind of mention that in a second. I've pulled apart my, um, my um, log periodic uh, system I had and I'm going to rebuild that. Uh, maybe back into this bow tie system. And the other thing I've taken down recently, I did have a, a VLF loop antenna sitting here, uh, but I've got another loop. Well, I've got another VLF system, which is actually my another earth probe antenna system. So yeah, that's my backyard. Um, yeah, lots of trees around. So uh, some opportunities to hang antennas. I've got a couple of other wires up there somewhere. That's the neighbor over there. Um, Eclipse, so just the other day, um, you folks over in the US probably didn't see anything much unless you might have been, yes, Hawaii is not even on the map here, but very much a Eastern Hemisphere Eclipse. And um, I was monitoring the Northwest Cape VLF transmitter 19.8 kilohertz. This is the submarine communications station. Uh, and I'm down here in Kingston and um, the tote path of totality went right over the transmitter, which is a pretty rare event. Um, not that that's particularly important in my observations, because uh, most of the path actually was in the eclipse, which is kind of you know, the key thing. But I was also monitoring some other transmitters in up here in um, India, um, South Korea, Japan, and the US. So I've got some other observations, but I'm just going to show you here the Northwest Cape measurements. Um, so um, we're down here, it was about 10 ish, as well, 12% down here for us. So, what I've been doing for a number of years is I started off in high school <laughs> doing this sort of stuff for, um, I was part of the AAVSO uh, SID monitoring program, um, Southern Atmospheric Disturbances, got interested in that. Um, actually, I got interested in that because of Great Reaver. Um, I knew Great Reaver at the time because he, uh, he's one of the pioneers of radio astronomy and settled in Tasmania. And we got a, a message from Casper Hosfield at AABSO and said, uh, is anybody in Tasmania interested in uh, SIG monitoring? And uh, Great put him on to me, which is quite fortuitous. And uh, I've been monitoring things ever since. So what I've been doing of late is measuring both the amplitude and phase of various VLF transmitters. And these two bits of information tell you something about how the ionosphere changes during solar X-ray events, eclipses, and um, gamma ray bursts. So what I'm showing here is really the effect on the phase of the Northwest Cape transmitter, um, showing a a retardation in phase as the uh, when the shadow of the moon comes along, basically it's um, reducing the amount of ionization, effectively changing the height of the ionosphere. The ionosphere is going up, and uh, this difference between these two rays here um, is actually a measure of the change in the height of the ionosphere. And you can actually convert that to a height in kilometers, or uh, and also an electron density change. Put in here, like these little markers are um, some solar X ray flares, and X ray flares do change the height and the density over the ionosphere. So, when these flares pop up, often there's a, a decrease in the height of the ionosphere, which causes a, a phase advance. Um, and during the eclipse, uh, you know, there was a small flare which actually had kind of the opposite effect. And of course, there was another flare over here quite close to the time of um, maximum eclipse, probably sh shaded by the moon. Um, and some other flares here on other days, which have some interesting effects. So I'm just trying to understand that a little bit at the moment, um, going back to the literature and seeing what other folks have done. I don't know if there's anything particularly new or novel here, but um, 
you know, a lot of it's just satisfying my curiosity. Um, this is a measure of the strength of the signal, and yes, there's a small effect uh, in here. These lines are actually the beginning, mid, and end of the eclipse as seen from the transmitter. And most people tend to measure amplitude because it's the easiest thing to do. Um, to measure phase, you need a, an accurate uh, uh, frequency standard. I'm using a GPS disciplined oscillator um, for that. And, um, but yeah, it's much harder measurement. Uh, and most people just measure amplitude. And yeah, in, in my case here, only a small effect, and it's a bit hard to tell really from some of the other variability in there. So interesting to see what other folks find. Um, I've put uh, the stuff up on, uh, there's a, an ELF, ELF um, Facebook page. So I'm just waiting to see if anybody else has made any, any measurements. This is the antenna I use. It's an Earth, Earth probe antenna. Um, so I've just basically got two electrodes in the ground for a north-south antenna and two for an east-west. And they're coupled to a, an audio interface via some isolating transformers. I'm just, just about to put in some lightning protection. <laughs> um, the system here, you can, you can kind of see that uh, if I've got a lightning strike nearby, I'd induce some pretty nice Currents in my uh, audio system um, that I've been disconnecting during thunderstorms, but uh, we don't get any here. But um, this is a really simple thing to build, you know, just some wire, a couple of cheap transformers. Um, you know, you need a, an audio interface, but you can use any of the sound cards pretty much. Um, I'm using this fancy one because I can sample at uh, uh, 192 kilohertz for this so I can kind of go up to about 96 kilohertz in uh, in frequency and there are some transmitters up there as well. But, um, yeah so really if you've got some wire hanging around you can make this and this also works at HF and uh, I've got one antenna in which is a shorter one it's only 50 meter length so as I mentioned I've seen some solar flares recently with that it, it's sort of got the directivity of a long wire antenna um, so I've got one north south, and um, good thing about it is it's somewhat immune, more immune to interference. It's certainly good with common mode interference, um, and I'm just evaluating that compared to other types of antennas, you know, dipoles and the like, and my other loops. So I have a doubt that if you're interested. Um, yeah. I'm, I might try and see if I can even do a Milky Way observation at, at HF on that and see if uh, it helps me sort out the antenna pattern. Um, I have used um, some of the amateur radio satellites. The Radio Sputnik and the Oscar satellites had like a transponder or a, a transmitter beacon at about 29 megahertz. And I've used that in the past to try and get some idea of uh, beam patterns. Um, the other thing I, I've, I've done of late, which I might have mentioned before, is, is the measurements of the gamma ray burst um, last year. And we've got a paper out with some colleagues um, comparing the uh, measurements in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, or sort of part of the Southern Hemisphere bit, um, using that Earth probe antenna, again, monitoring, in my case, Northwest Cape. And uh, this is the signal um, amplitude during the gamma ray burst. And you can see the time scale here is, is minutes um, compared with the satellite measurement of, um, in this case, an X-ray emission. In fact, the satellite's the one that's around, um, well, or was near uh, the inner solar system. This is the um, solar, solar orbiter with the um, x-ray emission um, flipped upside down <laughs> by a decrease in the x-ray emissions actually an increase and you can see over here that's the scales upside down and adjusted for the light travel time to get things back to an earth reference frame and uh, some colleagues in Poland were uh, monitoring uh, the German 
time sequestration, and they see a, quite a different response. So the nighttime arms here, which they're monitoring, uh, sorry, the daytime, they're looking in the daytime, I was looking in the nighttime, there's different um, time constants involved, and we've um, been looking at, um, at those. This event's a really nice um, case study because it's, it's bright and it's quick, and it helps you unravel some of those time constants. And a uh, shout out to the folks in South Australia, because they've got their Ecolisto tie antenna and other great things out there. Um, I've been looking quite closely at um, at these sort of antennas, because they're, they're great at HF. And uh, I've got a, a local guy that does some good uh, aluminium welding. And uh, I don't have, I, I used to do aluminium welding, <laughs> but don't have the setup, but um, I'm going to make uh, something a bit like this and uh, try and use that for the Sun, Milky Way and, uh, and Jupiter in the future. Um, on on yeah. that picture, uh, why do we see so many rocks just around the edges there? Uh, you oh, have yeah. to dig a trench perhaps, but did you actually have to dig down to get flat or what? Yeah, those folks, they, they put a ground plane in here, so they've cleared the area. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure if uh, you know, they've tidied up the site there a bit, but, uh, but yeah, they did have to flatten that out. Um, and um, uh, I guess you, you probably don't really, well, I suppose you could put things back. That's not important, I don't think. But um, yeah, putting a ground plane in is quite, quite handy for, for making sure you get the right green pattern. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can buy the amplifier, pre-amplifier system online. This is um, uh, Witcham Reeve in the US actually has a, has a uh, site you can buy this. I think it's about 500 US, something like that. Um, I might get to buy one of those, but I think I'm going to try my active antenna amplifier, which is a cheaper antenna amplifier. And I think I can do some mods to, uh, to match it reasonably well and um, give that a go firstly then I might I might have to go to this other preamp. This is really there's some really nice um, measurements that show you know it's really sensitive to the Milky Way um, so it's actually seeing you know the natural background rather than just the uh, the noise or the um, preamplifier noise and um, so yeah, I've been, uh, been looking at that and then in the meantime, trying out some Milky Way measurements with my other antennas before I get uh, back onto the, the little dish and try and do something with that. So there's plenty to do. And um, uh, I guess one of the other things I, I encourage is uh, keeping things monitoring. You never know what you're gonna find. I guess that's the thing with the gamma ray burst measurement. You know, a lot of folks kind of missed it because they, they only measure intermittently. Um, yeah, really encourage, it doesn't matter what you're, you're doing, keep something running while it's sitting there. Never know what you might find. Um, I know some folks, you know, are looking for fast radio bursts and other things like that. I think this sort of antenna might actually be useful for that too. Um, and enough, if you get enough of these observations happening, you can rule out local interference. So that's, uh, that's it for me. Great stuff. It, it makes me think, Andrew, it's time for me to actually retire and get on with some of this other stuff. The, the, the days and the hours just fly by. And um, I mean, it's been school holidays. Um, still haven't got around to stuff. And you've got plenty of space there as well, Andrew. That'd yeah, that's it's handy. That, that, uh, that tilt on the land also is good because it's north facing, so I don't have to. Uh crank things over too much. And so when I put my bow to and then I'm kind of facing north issue. Um, I see in the chat there a question about our latitude. I'm at 43 south. You're about 38, is that right, Paul? 38, yeah. Yeah. And I'm and right on the 145 west. The, the 145 goes through my property here. Yeah, I'm very close to 143 east. Yeah. Um, I found the Large Magellanic Cloud for those, somebody who was interested in seeing that. 
Um, and Joe uh, we might jump to you next if you've got something to tell us. Uh, before Andrew. we go off of Andrew, yep. Andrew, uh, a question on the phase. You were, instead of measuring the intensity, you were studying the phase, comparing it to a GPS uh, phase or, or a frequency standard. Uh, how do you actually do that? So you got two signals. Uh, and what do you do? You add them or something and look at the voltage difference or something? Yeah, it's complicated. Thanks for the question, Pete. Yeah. Um, so the transmitter is transmitting medium shift keyed um, information. And uh, it's not just like a simple carry that you can compare the phase against. But luckily, um, somebody else has done all the work. <laughs> And it's, uh, it's a guy called Wolfgang Dusha who's designed this Spectrum Lab software, which I use. And uh, there's a cunning method to, um, to actually measure the phase. And um, it's um, be a bit complicated to go into here, but um, if, you do, if you take the, the Fourier transform of the MSK signal and square it, you actually end up getting um, uh, a frequency at about uh, 200, uh, plus or minus 100 hertz, which you can then directly compare with, um, in my case, actually, it's a one pulse per second standard, uh, which then is used to, to derive a, um, an oscillator signal at the 19.8 kilohertz. Um, so that there's a number of steps involved. Um, it does seem to be pretty, pretty good resolution. The um, the signal is quite strong here. It's a megawatt tra the DRP for the transmitter. We're about um, six thousand kilometres now. But um, uh, I do this also with NPM, which is a bit further away in Hawaii. Uh, but yeah, it's it's quite a nice measurement, um, and it does seem to be at the level of accuracy where you can see. It's really small effects happening in the ions here. You can see the solar flares and traveling ions, rare disturbances, and all sorts of other things. So, quite accurate. The only frustration of late is, in fact, the reason I, in showing the data, I show, compared the 18th of uh, uh, April with the 20th, because on the 19th, the, uh, the Northwest Cape folks were mucking around with their, <laughs> with their transmitter. And I think there's some interesting stuff happening with. Uh, the US Navy system at the moment, they're doing some upgrades. And uh, I noticed that they're, uh, yeah, they're changing frequency slightly. And uh, that once the frequency changes, um, that's the other thing that causes a drift. So I've got a very accurate measurement of the frequency. And it's not 19.8 kilohertz, it's actually um, 113 microhertz below that. I can measure down to like a microhertz uh, of their, their standards. So they, and they keep changing it. And I think that's part of stealth, I don't know. Maybe it's something else happening. But uh, yeah, the whole system seems to be getting some upgrades that uh, are making it harder for folks like me to use their system. Um, and uh, actually, it's not just me that's using it. There's uh, a wide range of um, geophysical people using this for, for things like lightning measurements and all sorts of other investigations of the ionosphere. So. Well, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, if I have questions, I'll come find you. I'll, yeah, I'll great. Try. Thanks. Any, any more comments on Andrew's stuff? I think the main thing, Andrew, you might be listening to the signal, but you're not trying to decode it, so you should be all right. That's Mark. right. Yeah, no, it's encrypted. You can't, and folks yeah. have tried to look at that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> it might be a it's knock probably on just, the door. It's probably... It's probably just sending what uh, you know what what the uh, what the menu is at the local um, yeah. uh, navy base to the submarine base. Yeah. Or the football results. Yeah. Yeah, there might be a knock on the door three o'clock in the morning. You want to watch out. Okay. I'll tell you what they. Uh, I'll tell you what we'd always get receipts uh, from that. It's very very slow. We'd get uh, each of the wives got 30, uh, 30 words to send to the husbands. And their family. Yeah, Rich, yeah, that's uh, right. You're, uh, you're, you're well aware of this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah my mm -hmm. job was to screen those to make sure that uh, they didn't say that they were getting a divorce or anything like that in the 30 word uh, context. So we had to screen those out before this crew saw them. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's probably what they're all sending. 
actually, just very quickly on that, I, I've been in the Antarctic where we also had word limits uh, back in the day when we had just HF comms rather than satellite comms, and we had this five-letter system uh, of uh, sort of coding so that you know long sentences could be reduced down to what we call the wizard code, um, five letters, and uh, you know there'd be a code for you know I've grown a, a magnificent beard or um, you know I'm just going out you know to you know the the hut for a, a few weeks and that all be condensed down to five words and that really saved mm -hmm. on transmission time. Yeah. Um, I was just going to share the large Magellanic cloud, which I think is that I think that's southern hemisphere only, is it? It is for me, yeah. Yeah, it's um nice one. Come on, here we are. Um now you can just see it in this shot, which is oh, the wrong one. Right there. Right in the middle. I don't know whether it's showing up on your screens. Um so the, the that's the camera trying to make the best of it it was actually naked eye easily naked eye on on the day itself um the other one over on the right hand side is is a local cloud water cloud rather than a large magellanic cloud and the small magellanic would be probably behind these trees i think it's down here somewhere so not quite visible um, I haven't been able to make it out, but I certainly see those. When I go on summer holiday, we just go an hour south of Melbourne, and uh, from that beach, you're looking, you're looking pretty much down to towards Tasmania, and that's all visible. It's all the the two clouds are really easy from that location. Um. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit like uh, I guess you guys could share. Um, Ursa Major and uh, Cassiopeia and things like that, ones that we can't see from this from this angle. Um, I don't know whether anybody does optical astronomy, but we might do a, a comparison. Uh, Joe, do you have anything to report? You've got some very spectacular artwork behind you. Is that something you knocked off this morning? No, good morning, everyone. No, it's not. That's uh, just one I picked offline, that, which I rather liked. Um, don't have much to report. Thank you, Ted, for asking that question about phase measurement, because that was something I was going to ask. Um, I've always found that sort of a, 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 a interesting subject to measure phase. The old Loran type of um, of um, ID systems. Uh, sorry location systems that they had when I was at sea was a was a, always a bit of a mystery to me at the time and that involved phase measurement of course um as far as anything else is concerned I'm afraid of not much to report I don't know if I told last time but uh I have been invested in a dish uh it's about 1.2 meters in diameter um but since I've got it it's been sitting up against the back fence and it hasn't moved in the last month. I've uh, been just busy doing all their stuff, mostly movie making. So um, um, very not very much is happening there. I'm still struggling every night with uh, with with this stuff. Um, easy to learn, but oh, let me tell you, terrifically uh, terrifically complex if you want to do anything sensible with it. So uh, that's that's my lot at the moment. I think Paul. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, were you at the meeting on Monday night? Uh, yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I was. I travelled home from um, New South Wales. So, Rich and our friends in America, we had a radio astronomy section meeting last Monday. Um, I'm just waiting for the recording to come out, Joe. But um, I oh, think okay. that our dish up at the site at Ladies Pass near Heathcote is out of commission at the moment. You remember uh, the yes, it is. We we the, there's a lead screw with a uh, a, yeah. a brass uh, gearing and the brass gearing is worn. 
and consequently the, the elevation section of the dish is not is not working properly yeah. it's not working at all at the moment trying to no. get um, now we were to have had a messier party up at the heathcote site that was open to the public. We had 200 bookings for that through the Astronomical Society. Mm -hmm. And then on the day, it was declared total fire ban. So uh, as soon as it's total fire ban, that's the end of that. No one goes anywhere near. Uh, we're not allowed to go anywhere near the site um, for common sense and for insurance. So um, then they had a streaming party instead. They did an online streaming. Um, I'll see if I can find the link to that. Uh, did did you see any of that, Joe? That oh, I, have, I, I haven't done at all. No. Yeah. Yeah. So a Messier... now I need a little help on vocabulary. Um, what was it? Five band. Uh, what was the problem? Uh, fire band. Total. Well, uh, yeah, bushfire, wildfire. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. You. You. I think you call them wildfire. Bush, bushfire here. So the uh, yeah the country fire authority um, so there are different Victoria's desired, divided into sections and um, on that day that section was total fire ban and if it's total fire ban the risk is so high that's high temperature strong winds dry conditions um, you just can't go anywhere near so um, so we're waiting for the next one um, it's um, I don't know quite when the next dark sky visit. There's one, um, I think there's one today. They, so the Astronomical Society looks after the Melbourne Telescope, which is in the grounds of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. So if any of you come to Melbourne for a visit, we'll take you around there. Um, the... Astronomical Society and the Royal Botanic Gardens have been having a bit of a fight over the last few years because the Botanic Gardens run these light spectaculars. So they light the trees and you walk through the trees and uh, you have your dinner there and all those sorts of things. Really, really good. But of course, the astronomical, the optical astronomical people get a bit uh, annoyed by all the lights uh, that are destroying the viewing. Anyway, with the new president, in the Astronomical Society, he smoothed the waters and we're back in um, back in the good books. So now the Astronomical Society of Victoria is looking after the Melbourne Observatory and that's open to uh, the public on certain nights. And also they are rebuilding the original Melbourne telescope, um, which is, it was dismantled, oh, a long time ago, Andrew, I don't know when, or Joe might know. Um, so it was, it's a Meridian telescope, it's fixed, uh, but at, at the time of its use, it was the biggest telescope in the world, the biggest optical telescope in the world. It was dismantled and put in a shed somewhere, and now the, um, the enthusiasts are digging all the pieces out and reassembling it. With the, the building is still there, and I think the idea is to restore it to the building as a Meridian telescope. So as the, as the sky goes by, I think they have some movement up and down, but no movement side to side. So that that is a project underway and uh, will be quite interesting to see what comes of all that. Uh, I think that telescope, Paul, if I remember, gee, um, I mean, it was uh, built in the 1800s, wasn't it? And uh, Yes. Then it, I think it was mothballed in the 1920s or thereabouts. Yeah, long, long time ago, yeah. I think. When I was quite active in, in optical astronomy, or still being active, um, yeah, there were there was talk of trying to get it back together again. That would have been in the eighties, but yeah, well, it was great to see it happening. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can find out what stage it's up to, but I know that they were. I think they wanted to um, basically put it all back together, and I, I think that's a lot of work to do it. But um, that was the plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, if anybody's coming coming to Melbourne. Um, then uh, let me know, and uh, we'll give you a tour of all these places so you know you can actually see them. Uh, and I think, Rich, I think that's it from our end. Oh yeah, thanks, Ted. That's um, 
All right. And mm -hmm. uh, is is Mitch uh, from down there for our side? Mitch, I don't think I've met you before. Yeah, uh, we chatted uh, the first time we had a, a Zoom meeting. Uh, I asked you about your background, and that was about the limit oh, of my great. my con contribution there. Did you? Uh, whereabouts are you, Mitch? Uh, I'm in uh, Melbourne, Heidelberg. Uh, oh, my okay. my latitude is 37 degrees, 44 minutes. 4.85 seconds so, so. <laughs> approximately approximately <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not much of an astronomer i have to i have to put that in every time i talk to you guys i'm a, a carpenter builder and uh, mathematics isn't a strong point to say the least i know a bit of, about geometry for setting out the job and that's about it very good. Um, I'll add you to my reminder list, although it seems like you don't need the reminder list. I think you've got the list of dates there already. Um, and just on that, Rich, uh, we, it, next month, the May one, is, is the full one, the, the three monthly. So we should get uh, we should get a good turnout from this end in Great. for the May meeting. Great. Um, um, it's Let's see, I guess I can go down our list. Uh, Don, you got anything to go? Uh, just any questions or anything? Uh, nope. Uh, not, nothing to say. Okay. Um, Alex, you got any uh, anything you want to present or uh, any comments? No, just listening in. All right, great. Uh, Preston. Um, I guess... Uh, no, I don't have anything. Okay, thanks. All right, well, I, uh, I think that wraps it up for uh, this time. And uh, next time we'll get the time zone figured out. Yes. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's about it. Yep, from from this end. Um, but, uh, I, I just had one, uh, one question. It's a Ted, and I thought also perhaps we were going to be talking about TCIS, but... Uh, uh, maybe that's coming up in a second. Uh, but for Ted, um, great stuff with your easy RA. I've been having a look at that. It's not, um, it's really going to be great uh, to use. Just wondering, um, I know that the e Callisto folks, and there are a few others now, are using the FITS flexible image transport system data format standard. Um, have you looked at that? Is that going to be something you might get? into your system or is it there already perhaps? Uh, it's not there yet. Uh, I have some files lying around to try to play with it. Uh, I try to figure out how to fit it in. It seems like FITS has a format for everything and I'm a little confused <laughs> where we where we start. Uh, FITS is great yeah. for imagery, for example, you know, some XY with some uh, intensity. So that makes sense. But uh, the PNG files are just so quick and get pushed out. I'm not sure I need to have a, a FITS viewer involved. Um, and uh, right. yes, you could store data uh, that you've collected in a FITS format, but there seems to be a whole lot of overhead for the header, and I just wasn't sure it was really necessary. I was trying to make uh, my new format, I guess, um, as thin as possible, just so that everything else could be converted to it. Um, I'm looking for arguments there, uh, and and yeah. I will. It's just I haven't seen the need yet. Uh, so keep totally going. agree. Yeah, look, FITS is complicated. Um, yeah, and it's good for X, Y, but G, you know, <laughs> some overheads there. The only, perhaps, the only redeeming feature is that uh, a lot of other folks have, have got software that kind of uses it and that would be the only redeeming feature i think um i've used well, so, for, so i'd uh, have to put it into their format inside of fits and i'm not yeah. sure what their format really gets me um that's well, right the i have an about... immediate file in there that is a whole bunch of tables so they're just columns of numbers and yeah that would fit in uh fit in fits very nicely but uh, it fits in a text file just as easily, so or even easier. 
So I, I just question the need for fits at this point. Uh, yeah, it, but but educate me. Well, fits is a fits is a one size fits all. Um, the the header is all metadata about the data, and you can make that as as simple or as complex as you need, apparently. And uh, the and, and the so the 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 structure of the data is in the header for something to read. Um, and yeah, I don't I don't know that it need that. You could you can almost specify your own fits um, uh, metadata kind of structure, and maybe that needs to be done for our community, so that we have our own fits file, which might be as simple as as you point out, Ted. It might be as simple as a as a text file. I don't know. It it's a uh, I, I haven't looked at it any further than that, but I, I think it's a sort of, a sort of catch-all structure in which they tried to make it possible to put almost anything in the, in the body and then describe it in the head, so to speak. So, Andrew, if you come up with a need, let me know. I want to talk. Uh, yeah, great. I just haven't um, seen it yet. Yeah, that's right. I think the other side of it, yeah, as I sort of mentioned, you know, a lot of folks are using FITS. You might find that you get more buy-in from the professional astronomers who are already familiar with FITS if you can provide it to them, you know, in a format they can read. One of my bugbears over the years is, uh, is trying to, you know, create all these different decoders and readers for different formats. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, FITS is, is quite... For me, a bit cumbersome, but um, I know there's plenty of free Python and other software out there to use it. So, yeah, but I'll, we'll keep talking on that. My um, concern that each university would have its own FITS uh, requirements. And so that's a new FITS format. And so, yeah, sure, I could spit it out at that, into that. But these are just little converters of the data. It, it's yeah, pretty small. Right. Um, just the other thing I've been playing around a bit more with is um, I don't know if anybody's used Image Magic, um, which is really you know kind of a, a command line photo editing bit of software, but it's on you know a cross platform. Now you can do some amazing manipulation of um, of images and individual pixels, and that it, it's got some really powerful tools, very quick. Um, so, for example, my application is I'm taking a, uh, you know, the global lightning distribution map and then finding where pixel, where, where there's lightning in the conjugate region near my site, which is up in the Northern Hemisphere. But rather than actually having to read a whole um, text file of data or something like that, I can manipulate that image in about three or four lines. And so if anybody's interested, um, have a look at image magic. M-A-G-I-C-K. It's really powerful. Could have some good applications in radio astronomy for, you know, when you've got PNG files, you can really do some nice manipulation. Yeah, I just found that on there through Google, Andrew. So, yeah, magic with a K on the end. Yeah. Andrew, just, did you want me to go over the TSIS formula with you, or is that... Yeah, well, I was just interested in, um, I guess, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, when I was looking at this again, it's a while since I uh, did some cal strong calibration, but, you know, just finding a noise source, for example, uh, to compare with. I well, know the Radio me... Joe, okay. yeah, Radio Joe folks have done a lot of that sort of stuff. Well, let me, let me go over. It's, it's in our YouTube channel, but I go over about less than two or three minutes on yeah. how to do this with a parabolic dish. Um, I'm not sure I could do it with a um, a dipole. Let me uh, let me share this. And just uh, to say, Rich, that I really like that little uh, series of stuff that you're putting up on YouTube. That's very good. Oh, thank you. The um, I'm just a, I, I'm getting to the point where I've got uh, so many uh, so many ideas of what to put in here. It's all this mm -hmm. all the questions that I didn't have a clue. People were throwing terms around, so I just sort of I'm just 
pulling the easy ones out and then we can sort of build from that little building blocks yeah but um, the hub, sorry just to have it all in the place where you know where it is and you can go and reference it is uh, is really good oh, it's a very good idea oh well, thank you it's fun um okay so now tsys that what i like about the tsys measurement is that it really will tell you it'll compare telescopes to telescopes um like uh Wolfgang was talking about how he was, um, he got, uh, he was like a, a large thesis trying to get these uh, FRBs, but then he got um, these uh, LNAs that really dropped his thesis down. So now he's comparable to other 20 professional 25 meter telescopes. So figuring this out, um, this is the formula for thesis. And if TSIS is lower, you're, you have a better performance telescope. You can see uh, uh, smaller, uh, smaller signal objects better. Um, you got a T-hot, um, which is a defined temperature, normally ambient, you know, tree or ground temperature. It's the, it's the 270 to 290 degree Kelvin temperature. Um, T cold, and this is what uh, Paul, when you were pointing at that one point in the sky that had was empty, um, that's maybe that was your our T cold. Um, Wolfgang and Astro Peeler, they use declination 90, and they call that 10 degrees Kelvin uh, for T cold when they look up there. And then why? Here's sort of the trick: if you aim it at um, T hot. You take your signal level, it could be in volts or millivolts, whatever you, you got it. You take that number that you measured, and then you when you measure it at T cold, you take that number. So it could be, you know, volts over volts. And um, and by doing that, you've got this Y value, and that'll allow, allow you to pump out a, a T sys number. So an example is, and I, and I'm sorry, I'm using uh, imperial coordinates. I've got that, or imperial uh, temperatures. But uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and say I measured T hot as 1.5 volts, and I was pointing at the trees, and uh, TC is one volt, and I was pointing at 90 degrees in the sky, or maybe at clear sky spot that uh, Paul was talking about for the southern. So I'm converting it now to Kelvin. So if you guys are in centigrade, you just convert it to Kelvin. So you, you just want to end up in Kelvin on both of those. And you calculate that. And you get like a T sys of 558 Kelvin, All right? Which is not very good. I think a T sys needs to be in the below 200s to be a good telescope. Um, and so now you you you've made a bunch of improvements, and uh, but the temperature went down, and you got these new voltage readings when you pointed at the uh, the, the trees, and then you pointed at the sky, and uh, and now you come up with your T sys is now 165. So that shows that you've drastically improved your tel your uh, radio telescope sensitivity, and you can compare that TSIS with, you know, your say it's a three meter dish to a, a twenty five meter dish, and say what's the TSIS difference of those. So uh, that really sort of gives you the uh, um, the difference on. Uh, and I just think it's a cool measurement that uh, everybody can do, and it's pretty easy to do. So, uh, any questions on that? Yeah, certainly um, feasible to do that with a dish. Uh, dipoles, different problems, you know, you can't count them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you aim a dipole. Uh, and, yeah, uh, although with my, so for example, my um, loops, yes, I can rotate them and move them around. But, uh, yeah, um, at, at the high frequencies, folks use um, noise sources too, of course, because uh, down in the HF, you know, you've got brightness temperatures of many tens of thousands of Kelvin. And so you kind of need a, um, a sort of, people do use like uh, resistors, you know, room temperature resistors too, as a noise source. But, um, I, I think for your T-hot, as long as you can define what the Kelvin temperature is, and then uh, what your measurement is on your uh, on your screen in volts. So I don't think it matters as long as you know what the 
what your cal your source is, is. So the trees is sort of an iffy. That's why you sort of use ambient temperature, T cold. I've seen 10, 10 Kelvin, I've seen 15 Kelvin um, numbers for T cold for uh, open sky. Um, so yeah, if you can define that very closely and that all you're doing is you're measuring, it, this is just a ratio, you're measuring uh, actual voltages against uh, you know, presumed temperatures and uh, coming up with a system noise. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's, uh, and so what I'm trying to do for the journal is, um, get some, get everybody to sort of, Hey, find the T-sys of your system and, uh, sort of report on what you got and what you used for the T-hot, T-colds. And then, um, and then, you know, next, then two months later, do it again and make some improvements and see if your T-sys improved or not. And that'll just cause everybody to have a way to measure it, compare each other's and, uh, and improve. But, you know, Alex just did his, um, and I guess he had to help from Wolfgang and he, and you got, yeah, Alex, you were in the one, uh, that was your, uh, that was your uh, scope in the box and with all your improvements on it, right? Yes. And I don't know why S7 was picked because it's, it's hard to find, it's hard to define, and, and I think it's a fairly small area, but well, that's why I said, I don't know what Wolfgang did. I gave him a plot, I gave him a data set, and he came up with 175K. If I use earth and, and cold sky, my numbers are around closer to 100 to 100 and a quarter. So mm. it's, it's there, and I, I Every time I try it, I get a different number. So I just sort of said it works pretty well. But, I, and I don't understand the S7. Well, um, S7, uh, from a big scope point of view, S7 is this nice little narrow point in the sky of hydrogen that is a calibrated, well-documented level. Um, but at 20 but degrees I, beam width, I think okay. it falls apart. Yeah, with your beam width, I don't think it, it works because now you're looking at too much. You're not looking at S7. You're looking at S7 that much, and then you're... It's too, you're, it's too diluted with right. surrounding areas. Well, yeah, our 18-meter dish down in Haswell could look at S7 and, you know, with a 0.8-degree beam width and probably do just fine with it. And his, he's got a 25-meter beam width, so 25-meter uh, scope. And so that's the, uh, that's the difference. Um, that's why I think he can use it. The big, the big guys can use it, but the little guys have too much. They're looking at too much open sky, or sky that's not that. Okay. Um, anyway, um, we're trying to get people to do that. And by the way, the T-Hot, you can also use this foam uh, to, to use T-Hot. Just put it, put it over the uh, feed. And uh, that's supposed to be, you know, somewhere in the, whatever the ambient temperature is uh, over the feed. Anyway, so uh, that's my challenge to you guys is find the thesis of your uh, your respective uh, dishes and uh, report back. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, really important when you're trying to work out what the minimum signal you can see, because I guess you can, you can still see things that are smaller than thesis, but you need to integrate out the noise for that, and that's really important. Um, did I see somewhere recently that folks are interested in looking at water mazes around Europa? Um, and they're at about, is it 1.5 gigahertz or something like that? Uh, but they one, are very weak. It's 1.6. Right. Uh, 1.64, I believe. Right. Uh, no, not. I'm sorry, 6.4 gigahertz. Oh, 6 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry I, um, I, I lost my head there a minute. Yeah, six point four gigahertz, um, which means you can you you can do. Uh, there's some, and the name escapes me. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there's somebody that has actually been looking at it with, on the order of one meter or smaller. Uh, I think it's Edward close. Edward Mole. Mole, is that it? Mole. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you go to our listserv. You can look up all the, uh, there's, our listserv is a 
a water, a, a maser uh, den of uh, engineers who are just working on maser stuff. And there's two groups that are actually really good with the masers. And they're doing a different version. The ones are doing water. I think the ones, I forget the other ones, but they're different high frequency. OH. There's an OH uh, maser. There's an OH well. one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would go there and they've got all the details of what they had to set up and uh, even their dishes and their setups and everything in the uh, listserv. Uh, just search that and uh, they can contact them directly for questions. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, some of those mazes are quite weak. So knowing the TCS is important. But yeah, that's something I thought of for my small dish rather than going down to the hydrogen line is. I don't, I don't think they're that weak because they're doing it with, uh, what about one and a half meter dishes? I mean, yeah, they're, they're that's right. not huge. The masers, the, the, the masers they're looking at actually, um, are in gas clouds. And so they pretty much fill the beam. So you, you actually get a pretty good, a pretty hefty signal out of it, even with a small, with a small dish. Hmm. Um, yeah, oh. I was fascinated by the fact there might be some around Europa at Jupiter. Um, oh, that's that's, that's possible. Apparent, yeah. Apparently, they're very weak and not you know, have the range of. But you, one one thing you do is you check the T sys to see if you actually see them. Oh, you, uh, right. Yeah. Well, see if you can uh, see if you can get equipment to pick up a a general maser and uh, and then mm. uh, take that equipment and go to you know. You're invited here to Haswell, Colorado, to hook it up to our 18 meter dish if you want. And uh... <laughs> yeah, we've, but, uh, we've got anyway. a 26 meter. I got a 26 meter down the road. I could probably have a no. dish. <laughs> oh, I guess okay. If you really got a 26 meter dish, <laughs> I guess you could use that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, go and ask those guys what uh, if go and ask those guys if what their T sys is. Yeah, uh, I must check. Yeah, I I'd like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've got cryogenic uh, receivers up there. So, yeah. In fact, yeah. I'd like to ask the parks guys, and I'd like to ask everybody that has a dish, just to get a, a standard of what everybody's they think their TSIS is, and then uh, and then us amateurs can go in there and see if we can make improvements to get that get to that level. So, uh, yeah. All right. All right, Paul. I think uh, I think is that it. Yep, I think so. All right, and uh, I'll get this video, uh, tune it up a little bit, and get this video out here to, uh, probably tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Andrew, great talk. You, and, uh, yep. Good job. Yep. Good day, cool. all. Thank you. Thank you. See Bye. you in a month. Right. Thanks, everyone. See you.